Last year, we saw the first edition of Vanilla OS come out, an immutable system based on AB partitioning and the Ubuntu core. And this year, we see the release of Vanilla 2. Well, as Vanilla 1, I gave a lot of positive praise for the directions are going. Vanilla 2 is a much bigger headache. It's not entirely bad. And maybe some of it is just you got to tweak with some different systems and whatever else you need to do. But let's go ahead and discuss some of the issues, the challenges, and have a look at what Vanilla OS 2 looks like. Thanks for checking out this video from Switched to Linux. If you like this type of content, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. Check if you are still subscribed, if you think you are. And you can go ahead and leave us a like and a comment down below to help with the algorithm. So today we are going to have a look at Vanilla OS 2, and this is codenamed Orchard. So this one here is a distribution which is still remains the immutability. They have the AB partitioning, and they have a lot of other elements that make it a, a really interesting distribution. Uh, the ability to run different subsets and things like that. That being said, it is not without a number of issues that I have found with it. Let's go ahead and first start by having a brief look at their website. Now you can go ahead and download it now, and it is uh, publicly available. Now, during the alphas and the betas and the testing, you had to use a GitHub account to get it. So, in other words, you can't test this without a Microsoft account. So, no thank you. I pieced out of all that nonsense. I waited until it was available. Of course, over here, they talk about it being an efficient workspace, uh, you know, good for play, good for development, uh, a large set of, of applications, which is widely true. Um, they say it's solid as a rock. Um, I don't know. I'm going to go with solid reliability and stuff. Now, I didn't have it crash, but I did have a few other issues, and we will go ahead and get to this. They are using AB root. I think they launched it, and they wanted to run AB root, and they couldn't get it, and they used a different system. Now they're on AB root. They also, though, said in the past in version one, they wanted to have snaps working. It appears as though they abandoned snaps altogether, which is a trend we are seeing more and more. Here's versatility. Of course, you can even swap your graphics drivers on the fly with the system, which is pretty nice. As far as their release update, and this just came out a couple of weeks ago, you can grab it and you can install it into the system. They say it's reliable. They say it's safe. They say it's cool. Uh, experience a fresh modern interface that's visually appealing as functional. That's all subjective. It's based on GNOME. It's a vanilla GNOME. I think it's annoying as all get out because I don't personally like GNOME. That's your own opinion. I don't find it cool. And, um, eh. I think the only distribution that does GNOME well is Tails. At least they give us enough functionality to make it actually work, right? Um, it does have automatic updates enabled by default, although you can disable all that. And they do have a smart updates option allowing you to only have the silent upgrades going in the background when the computer is idle. So these are all nice features. Here's where they talk about the prime utility for... Uh, specific graphics cards, which they're mentioning as a uh, performance or a power saving option. And then they say it's compatible with everything. I'm going to have a giant asterisk. I cannot run Android apps on this. I'll explain my situation and how you could get that to work. Uh, so we have here um, a lot of different Linux apps. And in reality, it allows you to pull in from, from Alpine, Ubuntu, Arch, Fedora, I think OpenSUSE, there's a zipper in there, which I think is OpenSUSE. Uh, but there's a lot of different options. We do have the sideloading applications. I was able to easily sideload a Deb. I could not sideload an APK. Again, we'll talk about all of that. You can roll the system back. If there's some issue, you can roll it back. So what this does is, just like an Android device or a Chrome OS device, there's two partitions on the uh, on your drive, and when you boot into it, it marks this as a good drive, and then it keeps the other one. If any changes are made, it makes the changes to the current drive, and then it tries to boot that one the next time. Once it successfully boots, it makes a copy of that onto the older partitions. So you can always 
always roll back to the last good version, which makes it a very good, very stable system. If something happens to go wonky, roll back to the last version and it works. All that is certainly a possible thing. Now, where we're getting into the issues, as I had found, is let's go ahead and start and talk first about the installation. It is a flipping nightmare. It took me two hours to get this thing. As, no, no, correction. It took me about an hour and a half to get this thing to start installing. And then like Windows, it took over an hour to install. And then three different reboots to keep installing different software. It's like, what the hell is this thing? Windows? Literally, it's just like... We're, we're installing. Takes an hour. Reboot now. You reboot. You set up your user. We're about ready to go. Great. It installs a bunch of stuff. It says reboot now. And now it has to do more stuff. What the hell is it doing? I mean, really. Now, that is after I got it to work. I thought I wanted to run this as real hardware because I thought that this type of distribution is going to perform best when it's not done in virtualization. I couldn't get it to work. First and foremost, I have an SSD, which is about like a 30, 32 gigabyte SSD I have, which I use to test different Linux distributions. Well, guess what? You have to have a bare minimum of 50 gigabytes to install this monstrosity. So I couldn't install it on that. Well, I do have a backup hard drive on my IC dock. So I went ahead and wiped my Fedora installation, which I was using for testing, to say, I think that's worth wiping uh, this for. And guess what? It will not install. For whatever reason, it kept on failing on the install. I tried it a number of different ways. I tried going in and wiping the disk. I just could not get it to install. It's possible that that drive is on spinning rust. I don't have another spare SSD that's larger than that. Actually, I kind of do have one that I'm saving for a different purpose. Maybe I should try that. I don't know. Just thought of it. Just remembered I had that one floating around. But regardless, I couldn't get it to install on real hardware on my system. It kept failing. So then I come in and let's try it on virtualization. Well, it has to run um, EFI uh, mode. And so my GNOME boxes, for whatever reason, is running legacy. I can't get that to run. There's a lot of different things. Some people are saying, oh, just install X package and that'll fix it. Other people are saying, no, that doesn't fix it. I'm not going to try and mess around with my installation and my testing machine to do all that kind of stuff. This is a machine I kind of need to stay stable. I'm not going to start tweaking around with things to get a distribution to work. So I go over and I do finally get it installed properly under VirtualBox. So I install it under VirtualBox, get it running. This is where the Android issues were coming in, but I'm going to save that for when we get over to it. So after my installation woes, where it fails to install because you're not running EFI, and by the way, it doesn't just start you out. It allows you to run through five minutes of initializing the screens before giving you a message that says, Oh, we can install. Maybe you should have done that on the grub screen. Really? I mean, I recognize most computers now are EFI. Most computers now are SSDs. Most computers now are greater than 50 gigabytes. So maybe this is a small niche case. But the point I bring this up is... This is a distribution they're saying is an amazing thing. If you're going to test it on a machine, make sure you have modern hardware, SSDs that are large, and run EFI. However, you have to disable Secure Boot. We're going to get into why that is in a bit. But let's go ahead and have a look at the distribution itself. And we're going to boot on into our virtual box. So when we first get in here, you can see the previous state is the... Uh, basically the last known good that's in backup reserve. The current state A is the one that is going to be the, the current drive that we're running on. So we're going to go ahead and pick that and we're going to let the system boot. All right, so we get in here and we need to log in. Of course, I cannot use vanilla as my username. I usually use the distro name as my username. Nope, that's reserved. So I come in here and I enter my super secret password that's 
Definitely not 123, especially because they don't let you choose the password you want. They insist on you having a certain type of password. So now I have to do that nonsense as well. I mean, I get you want to be secure, but I get this is my computer, and if I want it to be insecure, darn it, that's my imperative. <laughs> anyway, we get logged in here, and we have our basic vanilla GNOME. So we have no doc on the bottom. We would have to pull up our system over here. Here's our photos, our files, our software. Now, as far as software is concerned, uh, the software, despite if we go in and look at our software repositories, and it tells us, um, okay, we have firmware services, and we have Flathub. That is our only option. Uh, I thought actually it had another, one more in there. I didn't notice that was firmware until now. So basically everything in here, you can install flat packs on the system and anything in the flat pack repository you can install and you can go ahead and uh, use anything like that as kind of a standalone on the core of the system itself. Every other application you have to install through different subsystems. Now, I will mention as well that when you first install it, one of the things that you do on the first boot is you go in and you choose the core software that is available. That's actually a really good improvement over the last time because it, it would, instead of just giving you this giant suite of GNOME software, you can see I, I left some of the core software out. I put some in, I left some of the software out. Um, I left out like the calendar and a few other things that I just didn't think that I needed for testing purposes. Let's have a brief look at that disk partition as well. Um, so here is the hard drive. You can see we have different partitions. Looks like they are partitioning it out a little bit more. So here's our boot. Here's our EFI. And then we have two different partitions here. It looks like this partition here is probably, let's see which one's used here. Let's see where these guys are mounted at. I can't even see which one's exactly mounted at. I guess it's doing um, uh, V roots instead. Okay, so it's using root A and block device B root B. So we have a couple different block devices on here, each set out as different sizes, which is set out. That's our, our partition scheme has changed a little bit from last time. Of course, you can check my previous video. Um, so I've given this disk 85 gigabytes and it is telling me right now we have 41 gigabytes of free space. This is actually a major improvement from the last time we're just installing the system. I was already running out of disk space. So this is actually greatly improved in those respects. Now, as far as managing your systems, you need to run your subsystems. So we have this APAC, uh, APX GUI system. Of course, APX is the packaging system that you use. But in that packaging system, we also have a situation where we have to install utilizing uh, different. Uh, um, I'll show you how it looks when we get there. And by the way, the documentation on their website is not up to date. So all their documentation all works with APX version one, whereas this is all using APX version two, you have to consult the man pages to see what it is. So they do not have their documentation set up right. Um, so of course over here we have our subsystems. So I have an Arch one, of course this is based on Arch with the package manager of Pac-Man. I have an Ubuntu with the apt package manager. I tried to do this one as, uh, which is the APK package manager. This is based on Alpine because I couldn't find any general documentation on running Android otherwise. And uh, we're getting constant failures here. Um, we'll get into that in a moment. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that this is Alpine, not Android. Wagedroid is apparently in the subset build up. Of course, there's no Wagedroid management option in here that I can find. And this is where we're running into issues. We'll get there in just a moment. Here is the different uh, package managers that are all built in. We have APK, we have apt, DNF, Pac-Man, and Zypher. So here we can install using any of these different packages. And of course, they will get us different versions of software. So you'll see that I have two different Audacities. I installed one from Arch and I installed one from Ubuntu. And I did this to show you that these are actually pulling in different software versions. So it's going to open it up and you'll see that the Ubuntu version is Audacity 3.4.2. Whereas if we go into Arch and we pull up the Arch version, it'll be the current one, which is, what is it, 3.6 or 3.7. 
So give it just a second. We're going to boot that up. And now you see that we have Audacity 3.6. Now, I cannot run them concurrently. So you, if, you, if one's already started and you try and run the next one, it does not allow you to um, uh, run them both. So I can only run one version of Audacity at a time. But it does allow you to do that. As far as installing other applications, uh, like deb packages, I, was, I installed Zoom just to test out installing a .deb package. And they do this through an application called File Roller, which is right here. Uh, so File Roller allows you to uh, open up archives. Now, allegedly, it allows you to open up deb archives and APK archives, aka Android applications. This is where our big issue was. So I go over here and go ahead and double click this one. It opens up automatically with sideload. Of course, we have already installed Zoom. So if I go to do this, it's probably going to tell us it's already installed or it's going to attempt to install it again. So you'll see oh, installation is done because it was already there. Now, if we attempt to install um, an APK, first you'll notice the default is not the... Um, the side loader, it is file roller. So we have to go in and type this in and then over here, hit install. And it says this may take a while and it will sit here and stay forever. Now, the problem is if you show the output, this feature requires secure boot to be disabled in the BIOS. So in order to actually run Android applications, you actually have to disable secure boot. And it's not just file roller. If you want to install something the manual way through the terminal, let's go into our downloads and you can see here's where our APK is. And if we try to install, I should have it over here. So VSO Android install, this is the command that I would do if I wanted to uh, install an Android application and even doing it through the terminal. It does tell us we have to disable secure boot. I have could not find any instructions on disabling secure boot in VirtualBox without disabling EFI. And of course that does not allow you to boot your system. So that doesn't work either. All right. Now let's get into the next issue that I found with this. And that is um, looking at your, um, management of your package. So if we come in here, this is the uh, information on running the APX. And if you check my previous video, you know that we ran the commands by running APX dash dash the package manager and then the software you're going to run. Well, this actually runs a little bit different and that you have to run the command a little bit differently. So in order to run the installation scripts here, what we need to do is we need to do AP at, uh, APX, and then you have to give it the name of the sub stack exactly as you typed it. So in my case, if I want to run Arch, I have to use the capital Arch because that's the name of my, my um, uh subsystem that I built. And now I'm not using the Pac-Man syntax. I'm using their syntax, which is install. And then let's just look at uh, Caden Live. Let's go ahead and do that. And let's see, do we want Qt or do we want Qt Multimedia? Let's see, FFmpeg or that. Let's just use FFmpeg. Uh, sure. And now I'm not going to install it because, you know, downloading the the exercise, I'm just not going to run with that. But you can see what we need to do. That runs the installation uh, through our uh, through Pac-Man. So um, if you wanted to run the same thing through apt, you would pick whatever command, uh, whatever subsystem has apt. In this case, it would be Ubuntu. And then you'll see you'll get the same thing. You'll probably get a slightly different version uh, of this. So you see that we can install that. And what does this one? See, this wants to get 400 megabytes of archives instead of 200. Uh, probably because I installed, uh, I think I installed VLC under Arch. So that's how the package manager is going to work, which is a little bit different than the old way, but it doesn't appear the documentation is up to date on version two of this particular software. It's slightly different. Hopefully that is up to date soon. Now, 
after saying all of that and saying there are certainly some issues that I'm having with the system, is this entirely bad, burn it with fire? Absolutely not. This is a still a very good, very compelling system. I just wish that, um, you know, number one, they would do a few different things so that you don't spend five to ten minutes of your life booting into the system before it tells you it can't install because either you don't have enough disk space uh, I can understand that one waiting until you select your disk uh, or EFI or things like that. But now in order to use the Android, which they openly talk about inside of their uh, documentation, inside of their blog post, if we go back and have a look at that, jump back over to here, uh, looking at our system here and we search for Android... Okay, you'll see that it comes with support for Android via Wadroid and VSO, enabling seamless integration. It's experimental, but it still requires you to disable Secure Boot. Now, I generally disable Secure Boot, but at the same time, um, there's an argument to be made. Why in the world do we have to do that? Uh, so here, this the you can't sideload APKs with ease if you have Secure Boot enabled. In my setup, I could not get make that happen. However, I attempted to install this on real hardware, and it kept on failing on real hardware. So whatever that happens to be worth as well. So you can see that uh, there's a lot of information in the documentation about installing Android apps, but the reality is it's not quite as uh, quite as easy as um, uh, as they make it out to be. But nevertheless, it does allow you to install anything from um, uh, anything from Arch, anything from Ubuntu. I believe the AUR is in there as well. Uh, at least I saw. At least I saw reference to it in the documentation. Maybe the AUR may not be available anymore. Um, but uh, you can install anything from Fedora and um, whatever Zyper is going to pull from. Uh, which I'm guessing is this OpenSUSE or is this from Gentoo? I don't know. You you guys tell me what what this is from. Uh, but that's kind of what we what we have. So let's see, there's vanilla, vanilla dev, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE. So it's going to be confirmed OpenSUSE <clears throat> right there. And then, of course, let's talk briefly about how you set up your, uh, your system. So if you pull this down, we can do a new subsystem, we can do a new stack, and we can do a whole new package manager if we want. So picking the subsystem, what we're going to do is we're going to give it a name, so let's do, okay, so so let's do a rundown as well. The previous version was based on Ubuntu. And I actually said in my first video, it'd be way better if this is based on uh, Debian instead. Well, they actually kind of listen. Not doubtful they listened to me, but they actually base us on Debian SID now. So we can do vanilla if we want Debian packages. We could do Ubuntu, which gives us Ubuntu. We could do OpenSUSE. We could do Fedora. Uh, we could do either one of these. So let's just go ahead and call this guy Fedora. And then what we're going to do is hit the create. And then what this is going to do is it's going to create the subsystem of Fedora with the stack Fedora. And uh, that it's going to give us basically the whole uh, package manager, including uh, DNF. So now anything available in the Fedora DNF package is going to enable us to install, and then it's going to be whatever versions are available in the current Fedora. So this is a really good system for running applications. If you prefer this particular application from this setup and this particular application from that setup, this allows you to do this with relative ease. Now, we don't have a real GUI way of installing software into these, so you do have to rely on the terminal, and then you are going to have to rely on your terminal for installing your software and whatever else you want to do. Now, the next thing, though, is you'll see it is taking a little bit of time to do this, and uh, if you can catch in here, it looks like it's downloading about 80, uh, 80 megabytes. You can see it's at like 50, 52, 53, 54. So this is going to take a few minutes. But then the very first time you run the subsystem to install software, you're going to have to wait about another five minutes while it does more initialization. Once you do that, then it is not, uh, it is going to work out, work out pretty well. So 
Head back down over here. Let me look if these, okay, so here's two programs, Audacity and VLC. So you can see I have what those are. I can stop it. I can auto remove. I can clean the package cache. I can reset or I can delete it over there. Um, so here's the Ubuntu. We can see I have Wave 1 package exported. Um, nothing in there. And then here is this one here. So if we want to start the subsystem here, it's now starting the subsystem. But then what we would need to do if we want to start, uh, install something, we have to go back into our terminal and we're going to have to do our APX Fedora, just as we spelled it. So in my case, I'm using, um, I'm using case sensitive and then we use install and um, let me just think of a package. Let's see if FileZilla is in that package. There it goes. Uh, apparently, we need to do a reboot. I don't know what was going on with it. Okay, so since this is the very first time we're running it, it usually takes several minutes to actually do that. I'm actually surprised that that did not, uh, did not take several minutes. Uh, but there, you can see that we are now installing it. And then once this is done installing, it's going to export the... Uh, the system over to uh, my main menu so I can actually pull it up and then it'll tell us what substack each application is running on and then it's going to automatically boot those substacks as it um, uh, as it starts okay you can see it's completed it says exported one application so if we go back into our menu we can see now we have filezilla on fedora and there you have it here is your filezilla application so there's FileZilla on Fedora. We had, uh, let's see, what did we have? We had Audacity on Ubuntu. What was the other Arch application? Okay, VLC was from Arch. So we'll start up um, Audacity from Ubuntu. Uh, so let's continue. Hmm, interesting. It failed to run FFmpeg. Okay, let's see. There's Audacity. Okay. Oh, did I move that to a different workspace? Interesting. Word FileZilla. Oh, FileZilla actually has a minimize button. <clears throat> Praise Fedora. <laughs> Okay, uh, so now I'm actually running three applications on three different type of Linux distributions all simultaneously. And this is one of the things that I really like about this particular distribution is it gives us the ability to run a system. Now, this is not a distribution for a beginner in Linux. Okay, this is not something that is specifically easy to use. Like I said, it took me about two, two and a half hours to actually get a usable system to be able to start looking at doing video work on it. Um, it's going to be really dependent on having better hardware, more available hardware, and more available resources. And you're going to be reliant on that terminal unless you want to run everything as flat packs. But if you're okay with those system requirements, then you can run all these different applications and you can do it really well as long as you're comfortable with the terminal and reading through and understanding a slightly different Linux distribution and a slightly different and in many ways new package manager to learn how to interface it. Although they do simplify things by having the exact same command because effectively what they're doing is they're remapping that, uh, that APX install into whatever command so you don't have to remember that pacman is dash s and then apt is install and dnf is, i guess everything else is install so i don't know what i don't know what zypher is uh but it is really good in that respect it is not a distribution for the uh new user most likely and it's not going to be a distribution that you're going to want to uh, use if you're still learning how to do Linux. But for a person who does need to take advantage of a lot of different distributions or want to test different ways, different distributions, handle different applications, this is an amazing distribution for that. Now, serious limitations right now. Again, number one, the hard drive space. Number two, you have to have EFI. But if you want to run anything Android, you have to disable Secure Boot. Some people will have a problem with that. I personally don't. Uh, the only reason I couldn't do it here is I couldn't get it installed on real hardware. I can't get it installed on real 
install hardware. There's a problem. Maybe it just doesn't install on hard drives. Maybe there's something goofy going on with my hard drive, although everything else installs on it just fine. But uh, there are some limitations, but it otherwise is a pretty good distribution. And I am still excited to see where this goes down the road. And I don't know, maybe when I turn all this stuff off, I might... Uh, see if I can't get it to run. I have one other SSD that I have sitting here for a project in the future. Maybe I'll go ahead and attempt to install it on that and see if that might solve that installation problem. I don't know. We'll see. But with that, there is my brief look at Vanilla OS. Let me know your thoughts about this crazy distribution and this crazy disjointed video in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. And uh, I'll leave you my last year's Vanilla video to watch as well to see how this has really changed um, from year to year.